The Bright Side by Jack Revolt on shelves. It might be sitting in side by side with Trent Cotchen's book, which I rather love the dynamic of. I've jumped out of order here. Jack's actually on his way to the book launch and I've got him to stop by the studio on the way in. So Jack, I'm indebted to you. Thanks for coming into the studio. It's great to see you. It's great to be here, Jared. And I thought if I'm going to launch a book, you, well, you, you've you written the forward in it. So I do owe you a massive thank you for starters. And before I even launch it, I thought I'd come in here and have a quick chat to you about it. You're a good man. And so I am so curious about this. Is this like mates sitting side by side doing their exam and then swapping notes afterwards? Is it like a joint assignment? Oh, you write this bit, I'll write this bit. Or is this straight out head-to-head competition? <laughs> Here's my story. Here's Trent's story. Let's see which one sells more. Oh, there's been an element of secrecy about it. But um, <laughs> look, I, I think it's actually quite an interesting um, position to be in is that clearly myself and Trent have lived the same journey, mine, mate, mine one year longer at the start. Um but all the things we've been through, we've sort of been through hand in hand, really. And uh, now you get to to read it in two different versions. So it's it, it will be interesting to see how how I've seen things and how he's seen things. Um, but ultimately, it's a it's an amazing story. And why well, wouldn't you want to read it twice? <laughs> Have you read his? Uh, no, I haven't. Have no, you read haven't. the extracts? I've read a couple, quite a couple. They've uh, they've, they've been interesting extracts out of out of Trent's book, which obviously uh, is a part of. Um, part of the Richmond story. So, um, yeah, these sort of books, I think they give you a little bit of an insight into, to everything's not hunky dory all the times. And, and just like every other person in life, we go through some ups and downs and, and books like this show that. So I've read yours a yep. while ago and I, I've started Trent and I've read the extracts, right? So the, the dream time post-match you've written, there were words said that would probably be best pulled back. And then Trent went, bang, this is what was said. Did you have a laugh that he explicitly said uh, what was said? Yeah, no, I think um, I, I think for me there was a fair bit of, and there's a fair bit of profanity in, in AFL talk, like especially when there's the, the um, sort of emotional chat that I like tried to remove a lot of that from from my um, language and from, from my book. Um only because it just didn't sit comfortably with me and I didn't think it would sit comfortably with the reader. But I mean, there's robust conversations, um, all the time in, in all organizations and, and football and football clubs aren't, aren't, aren't immune to that. So, um, yeah, it was interesting that there's, it's there verbatim. Um, but I mean, that's, that's, that's what books are sometimes do and people choose to, to do with their books. And, I mean, now if you want to hear the, the bold down version of it, maybe the PG <laughs> version, it might be go down the bright side. Uh, otherwise, you can um, you can hear the full version in Trent's book, I think. And the, I mean, the one topic of today is that the question around Trent's relationship with the coach was affected by the marriage separation. Um, I, I don't know whether yours was or it wasn't. Do, do you have a view on how that played out in the team environment? Um, look, I don't think it affected the team, um, and the performance of, of the team. Um, clearly it was, uh, it was, uh, it was a distraction for people, uh, in the football industry that all of a sudden, arguably the most successful coach of the, the previous four to five years, um, as marriage has ended. But for, for me, there's that, there is that line of, um, that's your, your personal life. And that was Damien's personal life. And, and I just turned up to work to be the best version of myself at the Richmond football club. Um, and, and I mean, I, I have a relationship with him, um, which was a, a vice captain mate relationship and Trent obviously had a, a really in-depth relationship with him as a, as a, as a captain coach and, and three time premierships that, that they've been involved in. So you, you, I can't choose how, how Trent reacts to that. I can't choose how any player reacts to that. I can choose how I react to that. Um, and for me, I, I remember having the conversation with Dimmer saying, that's your life. Like, I'm, I'm not going to judge you. I'm not going to pass any sort of information or knowledge to you or give you any sort of suggestions. But I'm here as as one of your, your longest serving players or your longest serving player um, and as a friend as well. I so enjoyed reading your book because it's, it's raw. Yeah. It's exactly how we know you. So I, I salute to you that it, it's true to who you are. What What did you... What did you want to convey when you 
when you agreed to the notion of, of documenting your story? Yeah, I was, I was a bit bewildered at the start when I was approached by Simon Schuster, who, who have produced the book to actually do it. Um, I never thought I would actually go down this path of, of, of one being interest, interesting enough to write a book about or write your own book. But, um, yeah, I, I think from the end of it, like I sort of look back on it all and, and there's parts of it that, um, I look and go, Oh, that's, that's actually quite boring. But then the people that have helped me along the journey go, no, that's actually really interesting. So it's amazing how some things in your life you do that become just sort of your everyday life as a professional athlete and a professional footballer, um, are quite different to, to people who, who aren't in, in, in those sort of circles. So, um, yeah, it's probably a bit of a cliche, but just showing people that I'm a quite a, a really normal person. Um, I had a very, um, normal upbringing in a, um, in a footy loving mad state in Tasmania. My father played a lot of football, um, and that sort of sport, and it wasn't just footy as a kid, sport was sort of bred into me with two parents that, that were PE teachers. And from there, it's just a, a love of competing, a love of sport. And it sort of still sort of flows through me today. Yeah. There is something very pure and loving about your journey with footy. Um, so I, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to spoil the, uh, the joy of sort of living it from beginning to end. And it has been, um, it, you lived it in real time with us through the retirement. So maybe just a, a couple of episodes. Um, the, uh, and I, so I saw this firsthand from both sides. The running battles with Mark McClure are absolutely hilarious <laughs> and maybe a little bit undignified, yep. but absolutely hilarious. Yes. Well, Sellers, uh, I think it all started in a, maybe a Friday night game, um, whether it was 2012, maybe or 2013, we were playing Fremantle over at Subiaco and, and he, and he absolutely went me, it might have been on Fox footy actually, that he, he, he went me, um, when I was sort of yelling at a teammate after we'd had a close loss, we, Hayden Valentine might've kicked a goal with a few seconds to go and we'd lost by less than a goal. And I was telling the guys to stop chatting to the opposition and just let's get off the ground because I was frustrated as, as, as a lot of the boys were, but, um, Sellers took that in a interesting way. Um, and clearly there was one camera focused on me and, and went out of his way to sort of make me sound like a, a prima donna, I think were, were his words that he used and sort of sat with it for a little bit. And then a few of my mates got on me and said, nah, we're getting him back. So uh, uh, an array of p prank calls and, and little pranks were set up on sellers for a while after he found out who it was. And then it led back to me and, um, <laughs> and we had to call a truce. So that, that gut, there's a gum tree episode. In there, there is a gum tree episode in there. So I, uh, I, I owed him a, a few beers after that, but uh, it was all in jest, but I look back on it now and thought maybe I, maybe I could have done it a little bit differently. So there was a, in your younger dad, there was a resentment to the, um, to the banner holders forwards. Weren't they? So it was Robert Walls and Mark McClure and they were the harshest, uh, they were the harshest judges of your, um, style of player. Yeah, they because both played for Carlton too, <laughs> Jared. <laughs> you were theirs and they were happy to put it right on your beak. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that was part of, um, well, look, I think that there's an element of you probably judge people harshly in the positions that you may have played as a player. There's an element of that. There's an element of tribalism as well. It's Carlton v. Richmond. Um, and, yeah, sometimes I think there's just, there is a, an, an older school way of doing things. And I probably got, I got criticised um, from two players or two people in the media, past players, that, that, that believed in that older school mentality of, um, just really sort of, no, not, um, begrudgingly, but they just, they, that's the way they saw it. And they then that's the way they were taught to see it as well. So that's not the way sort of a lot of modern media do it, um, now these days. And obviously I'm going to hopefully transition into the media too. So it sits in the back of my mind when you do go to make a critiquing conversation or a critiquing comment about, about someone, but they're all, they're all lessons, they're lessons learned and, and it has shaped me into to who I am. I mean, I, I, early on in, in, in my career, I had a real disdain for, for the media. Um, and that's, that's, uh, written about in the book, but I can clearly remember the first conversation I ever had at Fox Hoodie, which was with yourself and, and my wife Carly and the Fox crew and actually being told that you were 
you were wanted and you wanted to be welcomed into an organisation. And my, my whole view and uh, on, on, on media sort of flipped around in that one period of time where I felt like I was obviously giving this sense of belonging to, to another organisation other than Richmond, which is the only one in terms of work that I'd had through my, my whole life. So it's, um, it's flipped on its head. It's still, I, I find myself in a weird situation now where I'm trying to, well, I have found myself in a weird situation when I've been a, a current player and in the media and I can see both sides now, whereas, um, I only saw one side early on in yeah. my, uh, my playing days. 2016 is the, it's the big moment, isn't it? To live through that year and you can carve the book into into two halves, yep. really, can't you, around 2016? You can. Um, and, and 2016 was was a really interesting year. And, and looking back on it, I, I mean, we'd, we'd played finals, um, 13, 14, 15, and, and there was that expectation of natural progression. And we'd only just missed out on, on the top four a couple of those years there and, and had a really big surge in one year to get to, to the finals. But um, – I think for us is we sort of just relied on natural progression and we thought, oh, well, next year we've taken a few steps for next year in 2016, we'll, we'll, we'll make, we'll make the four and then we'll be a contender. Um, we had a few things go wrong and, and, uh, momentum is always the most important thing in football, whether that be in a game or in a season. And unfortunately for us, we never caught any momentum and, um, we caught the, the backside of the wrong momentum and, and, and sort of dwindled away. But, in hindsight, it's the it's the three steps back we needed to take um, to become the the real version of ourselves, and and, and not try and be a copycat group uh, and look at the um, the great succeeding teams of that era, which were the Hawthorns, the Geelongs, and those sort of clubs, and actually find our own identity. And and I mean, who was to know at the end of 2016 when a lot of these sort of catalyst events happened that nine months later we would be obviously breaking a premiership drought and celebrating the first um, the first premiership of, of a dynasty. I can't decide which story I like best is Brendan Goddard trying to talk you into going to Essendon <laughs> or you getting Nick Revolt to drunkenly agree to play for <laughs> Richmond as a rookie out of retirement. Yeah, so both very, very funny stories. I think um, and BJ was one was, um, I mean, there, there, is, there, were, there was a time when, it's like for a microsecond, I thought, oh, maybe, maybe my time at Richmond is up. Um, and I mean, it's a bit, a bit similar probably to the Fox conversation is when people show you an element of, um, belonging or, or there is a want to, to have your services somewhere. I mean, that, that for anyone is a bit like, oh, well, your ears prick up a little bit and you feel that sort of little, that, that, that sense inside you. But, um, the, the, the Nick one was, was the night of my wedding, um, and, uh, there was myself, Alex Rance, um, Nick, uh, and I'm trying to think if there was someone else there as well, but we, uh, we rang Blair Hartley, our, uh, our list manager, um, at about 2am, I think it was, um, after we'd probably all had a few too many beverages and, and we actually, we, we got Nick to, I think we got him to sign on a napkin, <laughs> but then verbalize it over the, uh, over the voicemail to Blair Hartley that he'd be quite happy to come and play for the Tigers in, in 2018 as a, uh, as a rookie, but uh, they, they are the, the, I mean, the funny sort of stories and the little things that you pick up over the, over your journey, um, that are, are great to tell people so that they don't just get hidden away in, in, a, in your own little mind somewhere. They actually get to, to see the light of day and, and people can enjoy them as much as I did. It's fantastic. All uh, right. This is the right question. Do Jack and Koch have a side bet on who sells more copies? <laughs> I don't know. I like to think the answer is yes, Travelling Pete. Oh, like look, if there the isn't a side is bet, it's like, I remember this. this is, I don't know whether I talked about this in the book or not, but we went to, um, we did a camp up at the Gold Coast. And it must have been 2018 or 2019, I reckon it was, pre-COVID. And we were at this MMA gym doing this like pre-season training session that was just ridiculous where you just wrestle for five minutes and do that for sort of 10 times. And I got paired up with Trent and for an hour, I tried to just do every little trick like in the book to try and get out of this wrestle with him. But he beat the crap out of me that day. <laughs> yeah, and it was just, but I, I like, it's just like, I cannot give up here. I cannot give up. And it was just competing, but it was the, the, the captain and the vice captain just going toe to toe in like a really ridiculous sport. But, um, 
that's there's probably an element of that too that we'll both run a curious eye over the other sales and, love and whatnot so but you can buy the both or you can just package them up and sell them to as christmas presents to people why wouldn't you buy both i think that's a perfect idea <laughs> we, we I, i'll pose this which has got the more cachet for the neutral fan so richmond supporters are going to have them side by side on the shelf but if you're a neutral fan i'm super curious oh four double three ninety eight eleven sixteen which book's got more intrigue for you? Last one out of the, the book. Um, sport is best when there's rivalry. And Richmond and Geelong had proper rivalry. And I reckon that drips through the page. How personal was it between the two player groups in the years where you're contending preliminary finals, grand finals? Yeah, you've got to think that there's probably a few elements to this is that I got drafted the same year as Tom Hawkins and Joel Selwood. So you always compare yourself to, to guys that are around your, your era or through your draft. And then Dangerfield and Cochin went in the same year. So we, 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 Richmond had a really unsuccessful history for a long period of time is that we're, I got drafted at the end of 2006 and I didn't play in a victory against Geelong until the prelim final, uh, until the qualifying final of 2017. Yeah. So that's 11 years of being unsuccessful and getting absolutely towelled up by the Cats. Like, I, I didn't play the day we got beat by 160-odd points at, at, at Marvel Stadium, but I was there. Um, and and they, they, like, so there's that there's that little bit to it. But then there's the contest from 17 to obviously through to, to 2020 in, in the grand final there where – there, there's, there certainly would, there was not an element of hatred about it, but there was just this two bloody good football clubs that came together at the point end of the season that had very similar list demographics that had traded a little bit of intel. Sean Grigg went down to Geelong, obviously, um, post two thousand and nineteen, and became a coach down there. Um, that just went out and had some of the great games of footy, and for us, we were successful in. In, in most of those. Um, so I think from, from Geelong's point of view is that we were probably the hurdle that if a few games had gone the other way, and then you look at the, you look at Joel Selwood, who's finished as a four time premiership player, that what does the Geelong story look like if they were able to get up over, over us in a couple of those games. But I mean, for the Richmond faithful, we were lucky enough to, to win those big games, but there's certainly a, a, a healthy rivalry there and a healthy level of respect too. I love that in the lead up to 2020, you're waiting for, you're waiting for Dimmer to use the pre-season Chris Scott comments that you're not Hawthorne, you're not Brisbane, you're you're not a dynasty team, and it's all, you're, it feels to me reading it like you're gagging for him to use it, and yeah. then when he uses it, it has the proper effect that you knew it would. Yeah, 2020 was so interesting, and and that sort of capped off the end of the year. But you you go from being everyone's second favorite team. Oh, it's great for Richmond to win it and break their drought in, in, in 2017. And then 2018 happened, 2019 we win. And I think we start to go on the nose a little bit for a lot of opposition supporters because I mean, you start to become envious or you think, Oh, Richmond, they have won it again. And then 2020 was basically the year of the villain. I think we had a few, a few mishaps in, in internally in the hub. Um, we certainly were, or on the nose, I reckon at the AFL, um, and we were lucky enough that we had our own, we, we, we'd stayed in this little student accommodation. We had our own hub with inside this sort of hub city of, 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 of Queensland. And I mean, the walls went up and it was, and we became the villains of the AFL. So each of the premierships has, a, has a special meaning, but that was a, a really interesting one where no one wanted us to win. Everyone else wanted Brisbane or Port Adelaide or Geelong, Geelong to win in, in that, in those last sort of four teams there and, and everyone hated Richmond, but there was a, an element of, of that we, we, we loved the fact that people didn't like us. Yeah. And even after sort of at half time of the grand final, th this is a, it's rich enough for you to be able to draw on. Yeah. And, and the fact that we sort of hung around, I mean, who knows where we'd be if Dustin had gone to, to North Melbourne in, in the end of 2017. But there's like those sort of moments where he, he stood up. We had a, I mean, I kicked a goal early in that, in the third quarter there and some of our better players started getting going, but there's just that, I mean, you really savor those moments. Um, and, and the whole of 2020 was, was one of those. There were so many ups and downs for, for, for everyone. Um, and then you go and live in this sort of micro, microcosm of AFL football in, in the Gold Coast and you become 
an entertainment product more than anything else where obviously COVID threw so many curveballs at, as us, at us as a society. So, yeah, there's, um, there's different elements to all of them. It's a terrific read. Um, I was fortunate enough to read it ahead of time and be able to write the foreword for you. It's it's a great encapsulation of your journey, and I think there are universal truths contained therein that the boy who comes over and the big adventure to the mainland and the flashy, selfish forward who finds his way to being the ultimate team player. I did rather like that when you were all allocated superhero characters by Damien Hardwick. He gave you Thor. Yeah. Thought you'd be happy with that. Yeah, I'm pretty happy with that. <laughs> okay. We'll broaden out a little bit. I'm so interested. We're all having the Melbourne discussion at the moment. They're talking about it internally. Now, publicly, we're analyzing it. The striving to build, establish, and have the buy into a culture. It's not that Melbourne doesn't have a good culture. I think the question is, how many individual episodes can there be before the aspiration is eroded? And what does that look like? It's interesting for us to see on the outside. It is much more interesting in the locker room where they do know what's going on and they do know the stuff that challenges unity and mission. And this is something that you would have lived year on year. I imagine it is a moving target that. Have you found a philosophy on what represents the culture that you're striving for and what's required from everyone to actually be what you think you should be? Yeah, well, I think there's a few barriers at this at the moment. Is the fact that it's the off-season makes it quite difficult. Um, I, I was really interested to, to hear yesterday that um, Simon Gooden hadn't spoken to, to Joel Smith yet. Um, and so obviously the players aren't at the clubs at the moment. So... I feel like this whole thing of, of Melbourne probably could have been cut in half, even cut into a third of, of the media air that it's got just due to the fact that there's players all over the shop at the moment, over over the world and people in different time zones and whatnot and, and being able to be contacted. But from a, from a culture point of view, I've always believed in, um, and we've spoken about it at Richmond, it's wide paddocks, strong fences. So... The theory behind this is that that you 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 let your players be adults, and if they go outside of 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 the law or they go outside of the set guidelines that you come up with, then that's when you you discipline them. Um, but inside of that, stuff like um, let's call it uh, curfews and whatnot is that you you have to be smart enough as a professional athlete or learn the lessons as a professional athlete that to know that every action has a, a, a ramification. Now, whether that be a positive action of just going out and, and I see players going out now and just training their absolute butts off to know that when that preseason rolls around, that they're in great condition or, or there's the adverse effects uh, effect as well. If you go and um, have a misdemeanor or, or whatnot, um, that you serve the consequences of that. But the more that you treat them as adults, they will start to act like adults. If you treat them like children and 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 want to um, micromanage every single part of their life, then then you never learn to be an adult. You never learn to be a professional athlete. So we we always believed in that 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 was the thing that we'd come back to is that yes, if you you have a minor a minor issue, we're going to support you. We're going to educate you. Um, but if you have a major one, look, look we 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 you have to serve your your, your penance. Um, so I think Melbourne's probably caught in that a little bit at the moment that one, the fact that they're away from each other, it makes it harder to knock it on the head quickly and have those conversations where you just stick everyone in a room and you come out and you go, right, you've learned your lesson. Here's what we're going to do going forward. So there's a, an element of time with that as well. And, and also is that you, sometimes people stuff up and whatever you put in place won't prevent that. And that's, that's true in football. That's true in society. That's true in any, any workplace is that people make errors of judgment or they do the wrong thing and, and, and you have to live with that. So that they're now, they're condemned to live this for the 12 month cycle. So all they're going to be asked about between now and March is all of this stuff. And as Simon Goodwin said yesterday, he's not going to be able to convince anyone of anything. This is about now what we do. You can't really do anything until you start playing. And then for them is their judgment doesn't really start until September unless they muck it up along the way. Is This is now about two straight sets finishes. Is that is that hard to shoulder for that length of time? 
Well, it's 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 important to know who shoulders it as well. It it, it can't be shouldered by the younger players or of 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 the organisation. This is where the Petrarcas, the Gorns, the Clayton Olivers, the Goodwins of the world they they need to they need to lead that football club as they have done for for a period of time now. Yes, they've had a, a slip up or a few slip ups um, in the media um, and in the media's eye. And I'm, I'm not saying that's what's happening or what's being reported is true. Um, but they need to they need to make sure that they get the ship and they start steering the ship in in the right direction. They they are the big players at that football club, and they need to make sure that they choose a direction they want to go in. They let everyone know what the direction is they're going to go in, and then they make sure that everyone gets on board. And that's the only way that they'll get back to September. As obviously straight sets when you finish top four will always heat that pressure on you that they need to get back there and give themselves the best opportunity, but also understand that next year is a new year and, and things that have happened in the past do not affect how they're going to play football for next season and how they're going to play football in, in, in the, hopefully for them, the finals of, of 2024. So is the first day, whatever it is, when they come back together as a group, does that become a big day? It does. It does because you come back and then all of a sudden you might be able to jump into some of these conversations. But I mean, if I was Simon Goodwin, I'd go, look, We've had a shit storm over the over this period of time, but we're back here now. Where we're in the same room, we're in the same football club, and if we want to, hopefully by then they've chosen the direction they want to go in. And he goes, "This is the way forward," and jump on. And that's that's going to be the critical conversation that needs to be had at the start of it, and and from there it will evolve for the Melbourne Football Club over the preseason into to obviously the season and and, and finals post that. And you've got a runner in the Melbourne Cup, Sulcum. Couple, yeah, hopefully. Valley, oh, yes, King, as Valley well. King as well. I don't know whether it'll run yet, no, but we'll see. Um, how do you get your horse out of the barriers? <laughs> so you've learned the, the hard the lines, knocks. Can't we? That you've opened the hard. Well, somebody's actually suggested that this might be a job for Emma Murray. <laughs> to get <laughs> out of the me, gates. actually. There you go. <laughs> what are the chances? Six legs last out of the gates in a Caulfield Cup for all the build-up that had to be a bit anticlimactic. Yeah, it was a little bit. Um, but look, we, we, Chris Waller is an amazing trainer, uh, and we know we've got a we've got a good horse. And and uh, Joe Marira jumps on board, with arguably one of the best jockeys in the world. So there's a few things pointing in the right direction for us, but. Um, for that, uh, for the punt road end syndicate, we're we're excited to to have a run. I mean, it's one of Australia's best um, sporting occasions, uh, annual sporting occasions, and to to be there and, and live that sort of three minutes of just um, nail biting, sweating in a suit, just anticipation is is it's very similar to, to the the three minutes before a grand final because. Yeah, racing is probably a little bit even more different is the fact that we, we can't influence yeah, one yeah. bit. Like I can't go up to Solcombe and whisper in its ear and give it some advice or something like that. But footy, we were able to actually impact and, and go out and try and get a kick and, and think differently and um, train and prepare for a mindset. Whereas we sit back in the, in the, uh, the lap of, of, of obviously Chris Waller, Joe Maria and Solcombe and the racing gods. Yeah. So I think about the two scenarios. If he's 24th, after a hundred meters, but what if he jumps and he's 14th one off the fence? Gosh, you're in for a three minutes then. Oh, they'd be nervous. It'd be nervous. But I, I think for, for Sulcombe, he's obviously won the Queens cup around Flemington. Um, the longest straight, obviously 1200 meters they, they come out of. And then a lap after that will suit us a little bit. We'll be able to sort of find our way. Uh, maybe a little bit. If we, if we do miss the kick, you can hopefully barrier draw. You get an inside barrier and you can sort of boot up the inside. He won the heavily from sort of booting up the inside and not missing it by much. But ideally, we'd like him to bounce out first, but we know that's probably not going to happen. And then it'll be up to Joe to steer him into the best uh, the best position for, for obviously giving it a crack at the uh, at the final post. See you at Flemington next week. Look forward to it. Jack Revolt in the studio. He's heading to his book launch now, The Bright Side. It's on shelves. Uh, terrific. Great to see you. Thanks, Jared. I'm not sure if Koch is a cricket player or not. He's a Bendigo boy, so I'm just... That Definitely would used have been. to be what you do is cricket in the in the uh, summer and footy in the winter. He's got a book coming out, and we want to have a chat to him about it. It's called From the Heart After a Magnificent Career of 300-plus Games, Three Premierships as a Captain and a Brownlow Medalist. Not a bad CV. G'day, Koch. Good morning. How are we doing? Good. Cricketer, tennis player in the summer months. 
Uh, definitely not cricket. I think no. I bowled one over and got hit for about 30. And Jeez. My, my best position uh, was just fielding, probably, to be fair. That's about my talent in the cricket. That is thrown half, us... Half a season, my whole, whole junior career. Yes. That's thrown us for a real twist there. So what did you do in the summer months? Uh, I spent a bit of time up at, uh, at Chukamoama, so water skiing and yeah, nice. dad uh, wasn't overly patient so he always um, <laughs> yeah. said if, if you want to play cricket you can get yourself there and home much smarter too than getting on the beautiful murray and having a bit of a ski and a, a cool drink rather than sitting in 43 degree heat up there sammy indeed it's, it's, it's a, a good point hey Trent, i wanted to ask you it's not a small undertaking to do a book uh, how did you find the process of putting your life down on on paper yeah oh. Probably in the initial stage, it was kind of like, well, what am I even trying to do here? But I think as I progressed through uh, and worked with uh, Glenn on, on putting it uh, into words and in book form, um, I really enjoyed the process of reflecting. You know, I think often as an athlete or us as human beings, we, we typically are focused on now or the future and don't often reflect enough. Um, and that's what it forced me to do, which was in the, the most enjoyable part of the the process and then just remembering things that had happened throughout not just my AFL career but prior to that as well and uh, have shared a lot of those uh, in the book. So yeah. um, there's a little bit of apprehension around <laughs> <laughs> sharing and, and putting stuff out there but I'm also excited just to – and hopefully you know, my story resonates with many people out there and there's some lessons throughout it that help other people on their journey in life. So we've seen some of the extracts that, that are, and we'll get to them in a moment, I'm sure. But when it comes, is it the first conversation you have with the publisher and, and who's helping you out with it that how far am I willing to go? Like, Because there's two different types of, of autobiographies really, isn't there? There's the warts and all. And then there's ones you can tell that, that, that you know, stuff's been held back, maybe to protect others as much as the person themselves. So have you gone more the former or the latter? Uh, I think what I've tried to do is is tell my story through the lens um, and and be as honest as I possibly can. You know, I, I'm not into adding sugar or mayo to any stories to make the it sound better. Um, and I've tried to incorporate things that I think have been a big part of my journey from a lessons point of view as part of my story. So that's kind of where it sits, and um, you know, out of respect of, of Everyone and anyone that I talk about throughout the book, um, I have tremendous relationships with all of those people, really. When you say apprehension, what what part of the book makes you most apprehensive? Uh, I suppose just just putting it out there, right? Um, you know, there's there's people that will love, there's people that will hate some of the stuff that I've shared, there's stuff that's part of the journey that hasn't really been documented before, so... Um, I suppose you just it's the unknown that causes that apprehension, but I'm also proud of the journey so far and um, definitely hasn't been perfect by any stretch of the imagination. So um, really happy about the lessons that I've learned along the way as well. Well, you've learned them really well. That's the thing that's going to make people pick the book up and buy them uh, because around the 2016 period, which you've reflected on, you know, things weren't going as well as what you would have liked and where you would have hoped they were to the point where you offered to have yourself traded if you thought it was going to help the footy club, which is a long way from being a premiership captain, mm. which took place in the space of 12 months. Were you, were you surprised at how quickly things turned? Yeah, I, I definitely was. I mean, sitting there at the end of 2016, and if someone had said, oh, you'll be a premiership captain next year, I would have laughed in their face. And and probably, to be fair, I didn't think it was going to happen um, in my career at all. Uh, but I once I went through that journey of re-establishing who I was and connecting with other players and, and what they wanted to stand for as well, um, I realised that it actually wasn't about the premierships. It was more about the way that we were living and playing and uh, enjoying, you know, the, the amazing opportunity we had to be at such a proud footy club and get to do that as a job was pretty special and then connecting with people. And, you know, even now when we reflect on, premiership years and so forth it's it's not actually the day that you reflect on it's all the stories and little moments throughout that season that were so special and made that journey so worthwhile Trent Damien Harwick's um, marriage breakdown is addressed in your book and and what you say is a distraction that it caused for you and the, and the rest of the playing group and you said your relationship with him 
was never back to what it was before. You still loved him, of course, and respected him as a coach. But uh, I think you said there was a bit of a barrier between you and him out the other side of that, and that never quite was bridged, was it? Oh, I have a great relationship with Dimmer and, um, you know, out of respect to, to him and his family. <laughs> I know that it's, it's mentioned in the book, but uh, I'll leave that for the readers. I think the hardest thing for me is when you do put that kind of stuff out there, the headline and so forth that gets attached or, um, as we all know, in, in some forms of media um, can paint a different picture as to how the story goes. So, um, yeah, I mean, there, there's no doubt it, it created some form of distraction. It's not every day. And I suppose from, from my point of view, from a personal point of view, I, I loved both Dimmer and Danielle and both Brooke and I looked up to them as, you know, a great example of how bringing your kids up looks like and the way that you celebrate family and incorporate them into an organisation and so forth. So it was probably mm. um, a challenge in that sense just because it was kind of, from what we saw, you know, the picture was perfect. And, and when that changes... Um, yeah, it was, it was a distraction. It's not like there was any judgment from our point of view. It was more just the fact that it wasn't the same as what it used to be. Yeah, and parking that specific situation to one side for a moment, how does that, you know, marry up with embracing imperfections, which I think was the buzzword at your football club when Gary talks about the changes from 16 to 17 and, and then the premierships that, that came, embracing imperfections. So can how does that marry up with that? Because that was seen to be a big part of Richmond, wasn't it, that, that no one is perfect and we are all imperfect? Yeah, 100%. And, and that's exactly part of the story. It's Everyone has their own story to write and it's how you come together and create another part of that story. Um as a club and as an organisation. And, you know, I think just on the back of what was an amazing period for our footy club over those four years um, and then the hub year and, and everything, I think we just literally got a little bit tired and things became a little bit more challenging, which obviously breaks down some of the stuff that you've been so strong in. Um, and, and, and that's probably what I'm excited about now, having stepped away from the footy club, is seeing, you know, other guys, stepping up to the plate and, and putting their spin on things and, and reconnecting the footy club in the powerful way that we had it going uh, through those dominant years. And, um, you know, as a supporter now, I get to sit back and, and watch that unfold from afar. With Trent Cotchin uh, from the heart as the book's out now, I'm, I'm sure that people will be flying out to get a hold of it. Your relationship with Dusty uh, over the time, it was... Again, we're from afar. Famously reported, and I've heard you guys talk about that, you know, it was an unlikely bond and connection that you made very early in the piece and that, you know, he was around and babysat your kids and all that sort of stuff. And this was at a time when, you know, we didn't sort of know Dusty all that well and it was good to get a different size of him. Did it maintain that level of closeness throughout the whole of the career? Yeah, look, it probably wasn't that from the very beginning. I... um I think one of my lessons was that I was probably too quick to judge a book by its cover and given the tattoos and um, he was painted in this sort of I don't give a stuff sort of attitude, I probably didn't connect to him uh, as strongly or as quickly as um, what it would seem today. And But the, the lessons that Dusty and his journey has taught me is, um, has been amazing and and. and one being that you should never judge a book by its cover because you don't really know what's under the hood. And getting to know him on a more deeper and personal level um, has been a really special part of the journey at the footy club. Uh, he's obviously a great mate, but also <laughs> to to watch his footy career transpire the way it has. And I'm sure that many of your listeners can only appreciate some of the stuff that Dusty's done on the field. And he does make the game of AFL um, somewhat special to watch. So, yeah, uh, as you said, Gaz, uh, he's one of those guys that, He's generous, uh, very grateful for everything that comes his way and um, he's willing to, to sacrifice whatever he has to to look after those that he cares and loves. About, loves. I'm, a, I'm a big fan of what you've, Trent, I, you know, I know Ben Crow really well and I've spoken and spent some time with him as well and he's had an, obviously an enormous impact on where you're at and similarly an impact on the, you know, the Richmond Footy Club you know, through that period of time with Damien and you know, however else that influence has played out. I'm just sitting here thinking, talking to you now, and I don't know whether you've been an observer or of what's going on at Melbourne right now, a team that have, you know, enjoyed success two years ago, but right at this point in time, 
having their culture questioned and all the different things we've gone through. I mean, if you haven't listened to it, then you probably can't answer it, or if you haven't followed it, you can't answer it. But would you have any advice for them? Oh, to be honest, Gaz, since I've retired, I haven't yeah, sure, been engaged right. a whole heap in it. But, um, yeah, I, I suppose, I, I think the reality is whether it's sporting clubs, business environments, you know, even just being a parent and, and bringing your own kids up, there's all these different challenges that there probably wasn't quite as many of, um, you know, when I was younger and then obviously people that are older than me when they were younger. So it's forever changing and evolving and, and that's the way of, culture and leadership um you need to have your finger on your pulse and, and understand your people and what makes them tick um you know that the, the decisions that players or people are making uh, in society today um are a whole range of reasons as to, to why they make the decisions that they do so yeah. i think just from from my point of view it's, it's trying to understand that and ensuring that you create a safe place where people do feel supported and um can be at their best but also you know set pretty strong expectations on what's required as a player uh, but to know that if you do happen to have a slip up that there'll be support there for you and you make sure that they can get back on the, the path that's going to allow them to be their absolute best not just footballer but self really now Trent just a lighter one a uh, very competitive market is the book market you would know that you're not <laughs> even the only person in your old dressing room to release a book <laughs> yeah, you're a bit stiff here because Jack Rewalt's the bright side he's in a direct head-dead battle with you who's going to sell more copies uh, it's probably the only thing that's important to me is beating Jack in the sales, <laughs> to be honest with you. So if everyone can head out and buy mine and not Jack's, no, I'm just joking. I, th- I think, you know, I, Jack's one of my good mates and I, I'm so pleased to have seen his journey firsthand and the growth that he's had. You know, I, I had a friend text me the other day saying, mate, I'm definitely going to buy yours, not Jack's. And I said, but to be honest with you, I think his book would be an amazing read from a, you know, what I've seen over the last six or seven years in particular, um, from a leadership point of view, has been incredible. So I do hope that he, he shares that. I haven't read it myself. Uh, and he told me that Carly wrote most of it. His <laughs> wife, but... <laughs> just quickly, just a joke, but... <laughs> yeah. what, are you, what are you doing next year? What's going to be keeping you busy as you, you enter this new phase of your life? Yeah, I, I don't know exactly what it looks like. I, I love the idea of being involved from a mentoring and leadership point of view at some stage, but I haven't quite worked out what that looks like. Uh, we're opening a, a Pilates and yoga studio in, in Essendon called Core Plus. There's plenty of them around Victoria and Queensland. So, um, yeah, just joining that brand, it's, it's an interest that uh, we've been involved in for three or four years. So just getting more um, actively involved, I suppose, and uh, have a positivity company called Posi Socks, but we're actually um, rebranding that and, and going away from just socks and just trying to make a, a positive difference in the world. So plenty, plenty going on, gentlemen. Plenty on your plate, as we, we expect. And, of course, uh, Tim Watson mentoring you through your budding media career, which we will go oh, yes. watch with great interest. Yeah, he was very good. Well, he told us he was. I'm <laughs> quite sure. Uh, yeah, great to talk to you. I'm an unabashed fan and have been, and I think change and you know, it's discovery. and the, you know, It's a great story, so I'll be really interested to read it, and I'm sure a heap of people will get out and have a look at it as well. So. I guess you're on the – you've probably got 100 interviews on the to hustings. do right now on the hustings. So we'll let you go, and we appreciate you joining us. Thanks so much for having me, guys. Thanks, Trent. Trent Cotchin there from the heart. From the heart. The book. Um, who is going to sell the most? It is a hard one, that one, you know. The bright side, V, from the heart. Both have had good extracts as well. Disappointed oh, yeah. that he didn't play cricket, though. 